faces in real life, nice and close. Can you hear me, Ben? Can you hear me? Test, 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 test. Brittany. Dublin. Um, I am only literally here to warm the audience up, which involves very little, apart from telling you where the exits are and the bathrooms are and how you get out of here when you're finished. So the exits are down here in the event of a fire. Hopefully we won't have any, but down here and straight down behind. And if you want to leave early and the lifts are accessible by fog, so just grab somebody with a Techco t-shirt and you'll be able to exit. And then I think that's pretty much it. Um, bathrooms obviously are signposted down at the end of the room. But again, grab somebody if you need to use them. And I hope you all have a productive and fun product evening. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a while since I've had the microphone in my hand. Am I okay? <laughs> um, I'd like to welcome everyone here this evening. It's fantastic to see so many people from the product community on site in Techro in our office. It's uh, wonderful to be able to be on site again after COVID and uh, kudos to the guys. It's great to be able to support your event here this evening. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Anita and um, I'm the VP of product here at TechRow. So I've been at TechRow for four years now and um, I've basically built the product team. So I suppose part of that role has been bringing in the dis different uh, disciplines of we brought in product design, product management, uh, content, and research. So um, I suppose I'm a big fan of Marty Kagan and if anyone who doesn't know Marty, um, I think everybody has to see the heads nodding. Mm -hmm. So um, and we work off a similar principle in our product team and the structure of the team. So the product managers take responsibility of delivering business value. The product designers take responsibility of the usability of everything that we design. And then our tech engineers and um, our, our engineering managers and tech leads are responsible for the delivery and the feasibility of everything that we build. So I'm very fortunate because we've got a fantastic team here in TechRow. Some of them are dotted around the room from the product side. Now, everyone's fantastic in TechRow, sorry, but the product <laughs> team in particular are fantastic. Uh, we've got some of the team here tonight and I, I have to say I'm in awe when I look at some of the uh, products that I see the guys designing and delivering. And um, I really admire their kind of passion and um, to really be impactful on everything and um, always with that emphasis and focus back to the problems that they're looking to solve. So um, I suppose then if I were to give a snapshot view of TechRow, um, so TechRow is a product first company and um, in TechRow the research nurses and doctors are really the heart of everything that we do. So we are a digital platform um, that we offer um, like content, shareable content, uh, communications tools and insights and transparency uh, for our study teams and clinical trials. But everything that we always do, we always put that focus and emphasis back on research nurses and the doctors within trials. So we've been doing something right because we're with uh, eight of the top 10 pharma globally. And um, I suppose in our latest round of research from the products that we've been developing, um, the, we've done an outreach to doctors and eight out of 10 of the doctors that have come back have said that they see the absolute value in tech row and using it every day in their in their role. So it's a it's a, a wonderful uh, space that we're working in, and um, I'm not going to bore you too much about it. But I'd love if you want to chat further with me tonight, or if anyone's interested, we're always open for recruitment opportunities and and all that jazz. But um, I'd love to chat. I'm here for the rest of the evening. Everyone around tech row is here. If you want to reach out, you can get me on LinkedIn as well. Um, but I hope you enjoy the evening, and I'm going to hand over to Ben. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we start. Uh, welcome to Product Tank. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, we are a community-run uh, meetup for PMs, and for tonight we have an engineer in our presence, which is very, very <laughs> exciting. 
Um, but yeah, if you'd like to ever speak or to host a product tank, just speak to myself or John this evening um, and check out mindproduct.com for some of the videos from the other product tanks around Europe, um, as well as some of the content that they put up as well. Um, I would like you all now to actually please go to slide.com and put in this code because this is how we're going to collect the Q&A for our speakers this evening. Same for those that are viewing remote. Um, please take a look at that QR code in the number and there is a slight delay on our stream they're usually about 30 seconds behind us so there's an awkward silence that we have to wait for them to catch up so they can get the code as well um, all good with the slido can you get in okay you see it yeah. right um, we'll find out. yeah find out <laughs> very soon I'll give it another minute or two just for those joining us online and then we'll kick off with, oh, nice, already in there. Fantastic, how are you getting on? Great, awesome, good stuff, stupendous, most excellent, very formal, um, excited, very good, nice, top, stupendous, great, good stuff. So, um, yeah, those of you familiar with Slido, really neat tool that we use to kind of uh, engage with uh, people that are joining us remote, as well as the audience as well. Uh, we have a questions uh, section there as well, that's kind of on the other tab inside the polls. So any questions that you have throughout the event, um, just feel free to pop them in there. And then at the end, uh, Dermot and Braden will go through those questions. We can upload the, the kind of most popular questions uh, as well. Uh, someone's grand, which is great. Re-energize. Excellent. That's pretty good. That's pretty much right. Super super yeah, <laughs> very good. Very positive. Fantastic. So um, the last bit of thing, uh, we have another product tank actually coming up. We're flying it. We have another one in October with uh, James May, who's actually co-founder of my product. We have Janet Basto, who's the um, product CEO of PodPad. And then we have David Martin, who's a product coach uh, with Right to Left. Uh, they're actually amazing speakers. We're going to be delighted to have them here. There. There's a product conference on in town that we've just kind of hijacked to get them to speak afterwards. So that's in HubSpot on the 18th of October. Very exciting. Um, and now I'm going to hand you over to Brayden and Dermot, who are from Wayfire. I just realized it's like a blind date thing. They <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Brayden and Dermot, um, Brayden uh, pitched this talk to us, I'd say, a couple of uh, months ago. And um, yeah, we've been having a bit of back and forth, and we're delighted to actually see it come to fruition. Something that both John and I are super keen to hear and hear you guys are getting on Wayfire. And uh, yeah, to tell us about. Cool. Do you want mics? Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. 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 Uh, I know you're me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ryan says they can hear you, just, just project. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So um, I guess we, before we kick off, uh, part of the idea behind this one, especially after the intercom one, was I realized when I joined Wayfire how, just how many different ways there are to do products. And there's not necessarily one right or wrong way, but this was such a fundamentally different way of building a product that I thought other people might be interested in hearing it. And a key part of how we do product in Wavewire is how we work with engineers. So that was part of my pitch was, was like, we'll try to get a little engineering in this as well because that partnership, particularly on my team and the way we work in Wavewire is so critical um, to why it's successful for us. So I'll preface everything with a caveat of like, look, this may not work for everybody, but this is what works for us and definitely something worth considering um, at your places. So I'll do a very brief presentation just to give you guys a bit of background and talk about things. And then we really want this to be as much as possible, a Q&A. Um, we've got Deer right here, and he's been at Wayfire for two years, which for Wayfire time is eternity. Um, so I'm sure you have a lot of good questions. So we definitely want this to be as kind of interactive and dialogue as much as possible. Um, cool. So Wayfire. Um, Many of you may or may not have heard of Wayflyer. We're one of the Irish unicorns out there right now. Um, so we're a fintech startup. I'll go into a little bit more of what we do in a second. But basically, in April 2020, we were officially launched in Ireland and the UK. In May of 2021, we got our Series A. And in February of this year, we got our Series B, and we're officially a unicorn. So pretty rapid growth as far as companies go. <laughs> Um, what do we do though? Um, so fundamentally, we help e-commerce businesses solve a working capital problem. So a working capital problem is basically a cash problem. They run out of cash because you got to pay for all of the inventory that you buy to sell online before you actually sell any of it. 
you probably have to market it as well. That's really hard. Even if you have a great idea, even if you have a really profitable product individually, it's very, very hard to say, I'm going to buy 5,000 units of this up front and then pay for it in cash and then wait three or more months before you actually sell that. So fundamentally, we help them bridge that gap um, in a new type of finance. So basically, the way we do this, because we're basically assuming that they will sell the, that inventory in the future. We're not secured, anything like that. We get them to connect up a bunch of different platforms, shopping platforms, marketing, financial sell. We evaluate that. We provide them with different offers, so financing offers. If they take it, we ultimately give them the money into their bank account, and that's it. They can spend it on whatever they want. Um, you can probably start to get an idea of how much kind of software and product has to go on in the background to make all of this very smooth and fast. I'll be honest, at the end of the day, the product is the money, but how fast we can do that and efficiently we can do that, particularly for our internal teams, is really, really fundamental. So that's really where we focus in product and engineer. Um, and again, part of the reason this is so interesting, I think, so we went from 50 people in December 2020 to 100 people in September 2021, and we're now at over 500 people. So <laughs> we've had a bit of growth in the last year since I've joined. Um, I was kind of trying to run the numbers, and on average across product, engineering, data, design, we're about 5x growth. Some of those teams a little more, some of those teams a little less, but that's a lot to deal with, um, particularly for, for Deerwood, who <laughs> manages a lot of those engineers. A lot of interviews. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, some surprises that will probably influence your questions and some of our conversation. Um, again, not that any of this is right or wrong. These are just state of play when I joined and kind of today. Um, we've never had any Scrum Masters. That concept does not exist. I don't think I've ever heard someone use the word Scrum Master in the year I've been there. Um, we've never had formal QA teams. So QA is a big focus, testing is a big focus, but we don't have someone with the role of QA. And finally, we, up until very recently, never had a staging environment, um, which I think is interesting. Although if you look at Twitter and Facebook, that may not be that weird. Um, yeah, so just some interesting things that influence how product and engineering interact on a day to day basis. Um, so, what's a product engineer? That was kind of the pitch behind this whole talk. Um, fundamentally, trying to distinguish between a software engineer and a product engineer. And a lot of it is around culture and mindset. We expect product engineers have an extremely high degree of ownership, are extremely comfortable with ambiguity. We prioritize curiosity over expertise, so we'd rather take someone who's more junior but is very interested in the area and wants to own it than someone who's been working with that language, working in that domain for 10 years, um, if it's clear that there's not that sense of ownership there. Um, finally, we want people who expect, not just desire, but expect to be involved in every part of the product process, so evaluating the problem in design, everything, as an engineer. Um, is really, really important. And yeah, it might sound a bit weird, but I promise it works. Um, what's the result of this, really? So at the end of the day, nothing's ever thrown over the fence from one team to another. Everybody really owns it. A team fundamentally owns their area. Um, everybody really has to come in together and work together and have a high degree of trust uh, between product engineering, data design, anybody working on, on a problem. Um, unit tests. Jeremy, I'm sure we'll talk more about that or something else. Um, tests in general, but unit tests in particular, really, really important. And then above all, we don't think about protecting development time. We really think about protecting the team's focus. And it might be a little bit nuanced, but I'm sure we've all been there where we're trying to, you know, you've got you know, six engineers on a team and you're working on six different problems at the same time. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice how everything just grinds to a halt. Even if you think you're like, you're like that engineer is not in any meetings. All he's doing is working on the same thing all day. He's been on it for a month. Why is there no progress? And we we think about it a bit differently. Where it's it's not just about individuals and their time for development. It's are they having time to focus on the problem, understand the domain, get with users, even as an engineer. Uh, yeah. And at the end of the day, why we like it. Um, everybody's able to really think about the problems more. Product, engineering, and design are all thinking about the problem and how to best solve it. Um, and it really means product can spend that much more, more time thinking about what's the next problem that we should go to solve. 
Um, and that's it. So like I said, I wanted it to be as quick as possible, giving you a bit of background on how things work. And I know we guys have a few questions teed up already. If you go on this slide, next slide, it might be that. There we go. Um, but I want you guys to start throwing in questions as well. And then otherwise we can kick over to Dearman. You can pick one of those questions to answer. Oh, I get all the questions. Like <laughs> well, I'll, I'll take some of them too. But yeah. uh, right. I'm sure they're better for you. Um, I think I'll start with the end one. Was it a conscious decision to create the culture? So, absolutely, yeah, absolutely, it was a conscious decision. Um, when I came to Wayflyer, I was lured by a previous colleague, um, a guy called Niall Gormley, who I worked with for 12 years in the poker industry. So, I worked out in Cherrywood and Pocket Kings. I don't know, maybe some people have heard of Full Tilt Poker. <coughs> so, I was out there for a whole long time. I went, uh, I was into poker, I came to town. I was in a senior management position elsewhere, and there was no doubt I had to go to this company that uh, did this thing I enjoyed. And I took a role as a software engineer, and um, I got to work with a whole bunch of other software engineers who were passionate about the domain they worked in. Um, now, it wasn't everyone that was into poker, but there was a, a good contingent who were into poker. And it blew my mind the difference that made when you're working with a set of people who are passionate about the domain. Um, so every Every product interaction, well, the other advantage we had was we were headquartered in Dublin, the product team were in Dublin, the engineers were in Dublin. Um, ideation started with the product team, engineers and product people. And you had engineers that were absolutely strongly opinionated about the product they were building. So um, the interactions were just immense. Um, and uh, the efficiencies of cutting things off early, um, it just it was it was easy mode in, in full tilt because we had this um, advantage of having a whole pile of people absolutely passionate about the domain. So we took advantage of that, um, cut to Wayflyer. Niall is working in Wayflyer. Um, I get a text from him saying, you really want to come and work in Wayflyer. It's a bit like full tilt at the start. And what that translated to me was um, we had this business that was flying, that was like the product market fit. Customers were coming to us in their droves. Uh, things were growing really fast and engineering had to keep the wheels on. And uh, that's just a really exciting place to be for an engineer. But he also said he wants it to be like it was in Full Tilt, which translated to me being he wanted the engineering team fully involved in the product um, space. And that was really compelling for, for me. Um, so it was conscious from the day I started, great, that two years ago, there was only eight engineers in the team and Niall was already there, there pushing this culture. So um, yeah, we wanted to push a culture where engineers owned um, you know, owned the piece that they were delivering. They were involved from the very start. We had co-owned with like we, we had very few product people. Very start. one product person who was too busy doing other stuff. Really, so we were relying on the engineers to build the Roma. Um, but um, yeah, so uh, it was absolutely conscious. Niall was saying we want to build this environment where we hire people who have displayed an ability or previous evidence of. Uh, dragging projects over the line in ambiguous environments. So could, could give strong examples where they were able to operate um, where someone else might have gone, might have wrung their hands and said, no one's telling me what to do, or I can't get this decision made, or I'm dependent on this team to get this thing through. But they could show evidence that they had the wherewithal to pull a project project over the line by the by the horns, I guess. So absolutely, it was, uh, uh, it was conscious. Come cool. <laughs> on. I guess, well, maybe how would you try and implement this culture in an existing company is interesting because yeah. that's a related question. It's like, well, how do we how do we want to do it in a new company um, kind of related to how you do it in an existing company? Maybe it's more difficult in an existing company because the culture is already established and people work a particular way. Um, but what I've learned from Full Hills and what I've learned from Wayflyer now is um, it's, it's really easy to say it's about engaging the engineers, right? So, okay, what do you do? Um, so. In full tilt poker, it was easy mode, as I said. A lot of people were already interested, but everyone wasn't. And as we grew really big, uh, we had to figure out how do you engage people that you employ who aren't interested in poker. You don't want this split between, uh, you know, they're the people that are really interested and I don't really, it's a job or whatever. Um, and again, a little bit easy in a gaming company because like we ran tournaments where everyone used the software to play poker and you could offer prizes and people get to see your software and get to experience what your users experience and see the product inside out. Um, so how do you do that like in Wayflyer, that's you know a fintech company offering a B2B product, right? So how do you 
how do you get your engineers to know that product well? Um, and for us, the answer was, uh, well, it was multifaceted, but we put a lot of effort into onboarding and um, with like a very structured onboarding for the first few days anyway. And one of the things we want our engineers to do is set up their local dev environment, obviously, but we also want them to take, we want them to take, them to take the customer's journey through the product so that they find themselves in every part of the product. So I don't know about you guys, but I've worked in um, environments where engineers wouldn't, they wouldn't know the product. They wouldn't have been in the product. They wouldn't have gone through the things that the customers had to go through. And uh, it's evident uh, sometimes and amazing sometimes. How have you never done this thing that's our core business? Um, have you ever seen that piece? So getting, getting the, the engineers, no, no matter what role they're in, really early days to go through the product and have some familiarity with the product is very strong. But also, um, and a lot of places are doing this now, but um, metrics and instrumentation. What like so? We all, we all hopefully we know the north star metrics for our business, like full tilt poker, it's poker players, real money deposits, number of hands, number of tournaments. Really easy mode again in, in the gaming industry. For Wayflyer, what's it for Wayflyer? So it's like number of customers that have taken a cash advance, number of active cash advances, the amount that we're pulling daily. Um, the amount we're deploying daily. And these are numbers that people can get behind, like behind the brand, they can support it, they can see it go up and it becomes this really engaging thing where you come in on a Monday morning and you say, what are the numbers? You know, you're interested, what are the numbers? And that's very engaging. So that can be done at the business level, I guess, and also the team level where there's, I don't know, in the banking integrations team, for example, how many customers are uh, connecting with a bank integration as opposed to uploading PDF statements and how are we doing in our goal to getting the customers to do the thing we want them to do. So that engaging them there by metrics and, and helping them build a mental model for the system and their users has worked very well for us as well. And again, I think just um, uh, to talk to the product people, I guess, making sure that, well, number one, the engineers know what's expected. We expect you to own things and we expect you to be engaged in the product. Pro in the product. Uh, how do you do that? Well, like our career framework, our company values are all built around um, Ownership, um, curiosity, uh, and the engineering framework very much calls out. So we've got like associate engineer, software engineer, senior software engineer, staff engineer, and at very to various scopes, it's calling out this requirement to own what you do, to be able to be trusted with a piece of delivery, to um, engage with the product team, to define what you're building. But then on the product side, like we need to, like, and it's all done through kind of leadership, through like, a critical mass of people who push this way of thinking it's like um i don't know product like we've had uh, people on the product team who want to do the right thing and they want to protect engineering so they'll say things like well we don't want to bother the engineers until we understand exactly what we want to build or i didn't want to waste the engineers time and like we would encourage engineers to sit in excruciating product product discussions where like you know going over user interfaces and figuring out why something should be where and it's hours long and you know, maybe it's not for every engineer, but we, we would want uh, we would want to try as much as possible to put our engineers in a mind space where this really matters to them and they're feeding into those designs. And then that, that pushes all the way through the product life cycle. Like they feel very committed to it because they've been involved in the ideation and the early design stages. And then they want to push that delivery through. So, you know, I'm waffling now. But <laughs> it's, an it's an investment in the future though. Right? It's slower because it takes longer for people to build up that domain expertise. So maybe it feels like a waste of time because they're spending all this time in meetings with the designer, partnering with, the, with design. But they'll be able to say before the designer has spent days on something, we can do this component with existing capabilities. That's going to take us two extra days to build a brand new component. The designer knows that up front. They don't waste time on it. And the engineer doesn't waste time on it later. And like they start building trust with each other and the engineers already bought into the design. So part of it's it's an investment. I think the other piece is hiring. Like in an existing company, any at any level where there's a hiring decision to be made, you could start to hire for this type of culture where like Dearwood and I have probably hired half of the engineers who have joined in the past six months, where like we did the interviews with them and it's like if he said no or I said no because we didn't think they fit this culture that we were really trying to build in our teams. We could do that. And like in an existing company, if you really wanted to, like you could start doing that at the lowest levels of where do you have hiring power and like hiring for that culture and that mentality and starting to build that within your team. Mm. And there's something you touched on there, which was like 
and it's like we're talking like we have a source code and all this which works perfectly. <laughs> and, and, like this is this is constant, ongoing, all the time. Um, only recently, like, um, and we're standing up new teams and we're hiring new people. And I had an instance of that where um, uh, one of my engineering managers said, "Oh, well, we only got eyes on the design very late, and um, you know, we it, it kind of had to go back to the drawing board because of the feedback we had in it." And like, that's not what we're trying to do, but it gives a, it gives a great opportunity uh, for Chesco, who's the guy who's involved, to 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 to, to talk about this when. When we're presenting this, uh, it, it was a change to our onboarding flow. When we're presenting this to the team, talk about how, you know, um, what happened here actually was uh, the engineers were busy, and we, the, uh, Amy, the designer, and Eva tried to protect the engineers, and it ended up costing more in the end because they spent days getting it into a state where they thought it was suitable to bring to the engineer. The engineer took a look at it, and uh, the engineers took a look at it, and uh, after the interaction, then it went back to the drawing board, and it was a really high latency inter you know, iteration rather than something that could have happened much quicker. Um, but so, it's a, so when these things happen, they're great to just nail it. There's a good example of that, and then use it and, and use it to show other people what you mean, um, so that um, when 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 someone has that thought again, I don't wanna, I want to protect them because they're busy doing something. It's like no, you know, this is a this is an opportunity to to breathe the culture that we want here. So. And then, yeah, the hiring, um, uh, yeah, I do a lot of screeners, actually. I haven't done, and, and we did the technical sessions, the deep technical sessions to the engineers uh, in the last year or so, year and a half. But when I'm screening someone, I'm looking for two things. I'm looking for, obviously, the technical chops. So I do, like, a deep dive where I see if someone can get deep on something with me, and hopefully I learn something or they explain to me something interesting. And I do uh, half, a, but the first half of the session is really just on, can this person communicate with me? Can I understand what they're saying? More importantly, can they tell me what the business they work for does and what is success for that business? And like, you'd be surprised how often that dazzles an engineering candidate. And uh, you know, and uh, you know, might have to explain. So, like, is, is the company interested? In obviously, probably making money, but maybe there's more to it. Maybe you have a mission statement, and it's like, you know, uh, some people are engaged with that; they don't understand what you're talking about, and some people don't. And then, like, obviously, for an engineer in a product role, a really strong candidate would be able to tell me like why their pro what their product is, what problem it solves, uh, why it's better than the competitors, why it's weaker than the competitors, uh, what they would do to, to, to fix it if they had infinite resources. Um, so that's as much a part of the screener as the technical piece. And we do rely on obviously a heavy technical interview downstream, but um, and there's a culture session downstream that you know, Brady, we were talking about this earlier on. It's it's we will not we will not hire someone if they screw up in the culture session. So if we don't think they're a fit uh, for the culture, it doesn't matter if they nail the technical session. Uh, you know, we've we've not gone ahead with candidates because there was red flags raised in the culture session. So um, that's something that um, people when they come, they really uh, resonate. That really resonates with them. They, like they're going, oh, you know, the culture session is actually really important um, when you're doing a debrief, and I think people like that a lot because. They can see it as a commitment to uh, building a particular type of way of working. Yeah, it's a reinforcing factor with existing teams because they see that that culture is <clears throat> is so important. You don't, you know, lower the bar with culture even when you have to hire, you know, sixty engineers in a year. <laughs> um, cool. Um, ooh. I don't know how to answer the first one. Is anybody from Intercom in the room? <laughs> I, I ask you just, the reason I asked the person is uh, the last product tank was in Intercom, focused around product engineering, really strong presentation. I think that's where two or three of the questions have been the breakthrough in my mind. Yeah. It might be about is that day to day is if let's say we have 20 users coming in, you obviously can't have an engineer in every meeting. Is the product person <laughs> diluting that down? saying these are the best examples, bringing in an engineer at that point, and how does that work then through design? Does that yeah. differentiation essentially between different companies? So I guess in a lot of ways, for a lot of our teams, our users are internal. So what's really nice is it's actually super easy to just sit down with the internal staff. You can think of about a lot of it as like, particularly for my team, a lot of it is a back office product. We're ultimately providing information for them to, and like workflow tools for them to make decisions. So I can go sit down with an underwriter for a day and just say, and like an engineer can do the same and just say, let me watch you go through your decision-making process and ask questions. So I think we're fortunate in our industry 
in, in that because so many of our users are internal that it's not like we have to observe a bunch external. We also have to be a lot more qualitative with our, a lot of our stuff. Like we're a small, a small ish like B two B company, so like monitoring metrics about users and their behavior is more red herring than anything else because the volume of users is generally lower than it would be for like a consumer product. So kind of being able to talk to customers or talk to internal users um, is really important. And we just kind of have those advocates or those people that we know are good candidates and we'll just introduce an engineer to them. There are a lot of times where I'm just saying, I'll be like, this is kind of our stakeholder from the underwriting team for this. This is the engineer working on this. See so you guys, have fun. Um, and like leave the engineer to kind of run with it but once we've kind of agreed on, look here are the general guardrails of this problem. Like we don't want to go beyond those really, but you guys kind of work together to figure out how to solve that. So yeah, I would say different than intercom, but probably similar in theory. Yeah, or like in, in like why we do it. The reason why I'm really intrigued is because if it's essentially becoming part of the product culture of different companies that uh, product engineers become more commonplace. Is understanding the different things that work across those different trends to then identify them and bring them back to a much narrow companies as well. Yeah. It's really interesting. Thank you. No, definitely. Uh, I think what's really interesting as well yeah. is uh, when the engineers are in the customer conversation, uh, they're, they're here in the context. Because as a product person, you bring the problem, you bring what we're trying to solve here, and you're saying this is a particular problem and it's X. And you're kind of getting people don't, if you don't have colleagues that are in those calls with you and hear the context, then they're, you know, I've often had an engineer speak up in calls because they've been in calls and they're able to speak up and say, well, actually, John has has hit the nail on the head on that problem because I've heard that from X or Y. So having them, like, I would love to have engineers that would be brave enough to hold a, a customer meeting on their own, it would be brilliant. But like having them in the meetings and having them in the background and just listening to the context is so powerful as well, even at a very kind of smaller level, I'd say. Yeah, yeah I, I think that the, like, you know, no one's saying that the role of the product person is in any way diluted. I just think there's a, there's a great strength and the additive power to have the engineer do it. Like, I think some of the things that you suffer from, like an engineer wants to solve tough problems and a tough problem to put in front of someone, they'll likely want to solve it. Whereas like a truly great product person can say, well, that's, you know, um, why, why tackle that problem when we can simplify it greatly? Um, I don't know, doesn't it, I'm trying to think of a probably contrived example. Uh, we have this concept in Wayflower um, when we give advances called caps, where we, you can take an advance off us. Um, we didn't talk about the details, but the, the, our customers pay us back um, based on their, on their revenue. So it's not like a traditional loan where you pay back a fixed fee. We agree terms with you that you'll pay back 10% of your daily sales. So. It's nice for Wayflower. We're in bed with our customers. If they do well, we do well. And if they do poorly, we do poorly. And so we're incentivized to encourage them to do well. So we offer insights in our product as well to uh, to help a customer do well. But we have these collection caps that um, ensure even if our customers have uh, you know stellar performance, they don't pay us back over a time frame that would be ludicrously expensive for them. So let's say if we gave someone a loan, and we charge a fixed fee, not a percentage. So if you paid back that, sorry, if you paid back that merchant cash advance in three days, that would be very expensive money because you pay the same fee as if you took 100 days to pay it back. And we've had really interesting situations where, uh, for Black Friday, for example, we had a situation the first year that we were in existence where someone took a cash advance and they paid it back in three days because Black Friday was the third day. Um, and they just had such high revenue that they just paid off the advance and it was really expensive. Um, so we offer this capability to say, over a certain period of time, you won't pay more than a certain amount. So pretty simple feature, don't pay more than a certain amount. But when that was considered, like, the problem was how do, we, uh, how do we restrict the amount the customer is paying for a period? And okay, you know, engineers are thinking about it, it seems pretty straightforward. You only want to take 2,000, say, in a week, whatever it happens to be. Uh, what happens if you don't use that full 2,000? Do you pull it into the next week? Mm, that was edge cases, right? So, okay, what do you do? Do you keep on pulling it in? And what do you do? Do you keep that state? And this becomes a complicated problem. Uh, whereas a product person came in and said, well, why are you doing it like that? Why don't you just say for the first seven days, I'll collect a maximum of two grand. For the next seven days, I'll collect a maximum of four grand. For the next seven days, I'll collect a maximum of 12 grand. And the problem just gets totally simplified away into something that's much easier than a, a nice meaty problem to get your teeth into. So uh, just an example where like, you know, 
leaving the product to the engineer in its entirety might lead to, um, you know, it, 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 they can, you can support with um, really nice product decisions and the engineers to, to think about their product decisions, I guess I'm saying. Yeah, it's a, it's a big mix. I think part of it is like the edge cases, if you find the right balance, the edge cases a lot of times go away. Where it's like, I what I've really enjoyed from the last year is like, I've never had to like write out like, this is out of scope, this is out of, like this endless list of like, this is out of scope, and these are the edge cases, test for this. It's like, the guys just get into the domain and say, you can do it, and it's like, they can raise those edge cases. or be like, you know what? This is probably only gonna happen 1% of the time. We'll ignore that. And I'm like, great. I'm glad you made that decision. We can all move on. And there's not like me sitting there for half a day like, oh God, what are all the different scenarios where this could go wrong? Which is a really good feeling. <laughs> that's, that's an ideal scenario for me. I want the engineers to come up with the edge cases because they understand the system and they understand the, the edge cases that can't go. And I want the product person to make it go away. <laughs> Um, oh yeah. Um, can you share three big differences between software engineers and product engineers when it comes to day-to-day -day work? Um, I guess a big one thing about the team day-to-day -day is um, there's probably less time than you would expect spent doing development. And I know we're all kind of worried about meetings these days, especially with like as agile and scrum have become more commonplace, right? Like everybody worries about the admin overhead. But I think it's being thinking critically about which meetings are, are value add and which are not. And like it's okay for an engineer to be in a meeting all day if it's about the problem they are solving. Um, and that's where it goes back to like the whole idea of like protecting their focus on a problem rather than like their development time is do they have the mental kind of cover to focus on that problem. So like a lot of their time will be spent like in meetings or talking to people, but it's fundamentally about most of that time should be spent on the problem they're solving. So I think that's probably one day-to-day -day difference is just like there's no